who is foolish and who is wise? That's what we're going to find out in Matthew 25. Hey, that almost rhymed. So now we're at Matthew 25. Again, there are 28 chapters in Matthew. So Jesus starts off with a parable about the kingdom of heaven being like 10 virgins. They each have a lamb. And in that time, you got engaged and you waited a year probably to even see the person you're going to marry. It's possible you met them before you got married, but now there's a year delay from the time that you were supposed to get married. So these 10 virgins are waiting on their bridegrooms to come so that that time is at a pass. They don't know exactly when the bridegroom is coming. Again, travel wasn't as easy as it is now where we just hop in the car and go visit someone. And so the bridegroom is delayed and they all got tired. They all got sleepy. And suddenly someone cries out, the bridegroom, here's the bridegroom. And so then the virgins rose. It says they trimmed their lamps and the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil. We ran out. And the wise virgin said, then there won't be enough for us. You go buy some for yourself. Go get your own selection of them. And while they were out going out and buying their own oil so they could see in the dark, again, we have street lights. It is pitch black, you know, at that time. And again, also very expensive to buy oil. And the ones that were ready and prepared were there, were ready for the marriage feast. And then the door was shut. The other foolish ones came back. Hey, open up, open up. But you know what? The time came. The door was shut. And Jesus is saying, you won't know the time I come back. You won't know when I'm going to be here again. And nobody knows the time or the date. This parable is interesting because this brings up the interesting point of in parables themselves. Don't get so wrapped up in each of the details. You know, we've seen a lot of parables where people are like, and the birds represent the, e-, you know, not everything represents a thing. And as Father Mike Schmidt said in his podcast where he reads the Bible every day, he grew up with the virtue of sharing. And the wise virgins weren't sharing. They weren't interested in sharing their oil with other people. So he felt this was, you know, probably a miscarriage of justice when he was a kid because they were taught to share and the wise are not sharing. Again, don't get so wrapped up into the details. Each parable has a point. Whether the point is going out and spreading the church, whether it's in this case, those who were prepared versus those who were not prepared. And this is what Jesus is trying to get across now. So the contrast here is people need to be prepared. The point, I think, in all of this is that there was that 400-year gap where we had the last prophet of God and, and didn't hear anything. And in the meantime, the Greeks came and sacked the area. Maccabees came over and sacked the Greeks in the area. And then eventually Rome took over the entire Greek empire and sacked it all. There was a lot of silence in here. I mean, we get frustrated when things that we felt were going to happen hasn't happened yet. John the Baptist comes back and starts preparing the way for Jesus. Now Jesus is here, and he's saying that when he returns, it's going to be likewise, that you have to be prepared. You have to know that Jesus could be coming back, and this time it's going to be different all the time. This is not a truly situation. It's kind of an absurd situation. But you understand that some people are prepared and other people are not prepared. And I think you look in your own lives. How many people think that they can live their life? Maybe they're Christians. Let's say that they're Christians. And they live their lives and they party up and they do all the wrong things. And they say, well, you know, at the very end of time, my end of my life, I will, I'll straighten this up. I'll confess my sins. I had someone even I went to college with who would basically do everything that she was not meant to do in her faith all weekend long because it was fine because on Sunday she was going to go to church and confess her sins. It's what people call a cheap grace where you're just sort of trying to put in a vending machine. It's not that God is not never endingly forgiving, but the idea is that we think we can time things. They talk about market timing, people who know magically when to put money into the stock exchange and when to pull it out, and they know exactly when to do it. You don't know when anything is going to happen. And the idea is to 
always be prepared. That's the whole message here. All right, so then there's the parable of the talents. And so Jesus said that there were these servants and the master is gonna be gone a little bit. So he gives five talents to one, two to another, and one to the last servant. And they said that this is each according to their ability. So this is an interesting thing because talent was a sum of money. And the idea of talents, that they were each given money according to their talents, to their ability. And that's the way we think about it in modern time. Your talent is your ability. So the one who had the five talents did trading, made more money. Then the one who had two talents also made more money. And then the last one, the guy who had one talent, he just dug it in the ground and buried it. And so when the master came back, the man who got five talents came forward and said, hey, look at all the money I made you. I made you five talents more. Good job, faithful servant. Then he goes to the one with the two talents and says, see, I made you two more talents. Each one of them has doubled the amount of money that they had. And then the guy who had one talent said, here, I dug it in the ground. I mean, I know you're a tough guy and you and you're stingy, I think is probably what it means. And so I hit it. I dug it in the ground and I hit it because I thought you'd be super mad with me if I took this one talent and lost it all. And he calls them wicked and evil. You didn't scatter any seeds. You didn't grow the money. You didn't do anything with the thing I gave you. And so for everyone who has been given a little, you're going to get more. But those who have not even used what you had, it's going to get taken away. Ooh. Now, this is always a very popular parable to talk about because it's really in relationship to what the talents our God has given us. Are we taking our ability to speak and bringing more people into the church? Are we taking our ability to do music or write? Or are we taking our faith and bringing more faithful in? Or are we saying, ooh, I have a secret. You know, I became a Christian. And so I'm going to keep it quiet. I'm going to keep it on the down low. And I'm going to come before God and said, hey, I became a Christian and I brought no one to the table. You know, something like that. Or I did nothing with my skills and ability. You gave me all these talents. And instead of me doing something useful, helping people with them, I just hid it all away. That is the whole parable of it is what are you doing with what God has given you? Are you the fig tree producing more figs? Uh, you know, and think about it in that sense. A fig is a single seed planted in the ground, becomes, is this seed? Anyway, becomes a tree and it produces many figs, which will then produce many more fig trees. That's how all plants work. But are we the people who aren't producing, first of all, the fruit we're supposed to produce, but secondly, producing more trees, more, using our talents to create more talents? I was listening to a Timothy Keller sermon this morning, and he was making the point, we are a church that grows by throwing seed out. We have that establishment of plants as parables to our faith. When we give away seeds, when we spread out seeds, we get more. It's not this viewpoint of hoarding or hiding. It's about sharing the gospel freely and throwing those seeds out. Think about it this way, too. The other two risked more money. You know, they had more on the line. They risked more. They got more. The guy who was given the least, he didn't have very much to lose. So if the one guy who had the five talents lost all the talents because his trades did not pay off, that's a big sum of money. This guy had a little bit of money and he was afraid of losing it. And he didn't feel qualified. It wasn't he was even being greedy. He didn't go take that one talent of money and go buy a bunch of beer with it. He was so careful and cautious. And I'm not good enough at this to do the thing you've asked me to do. I'm not smart enough to double this single talent into two talents. And so it wasn't even like a, a greed thing. He wasn't stealing the money. So I think that's the interesting thing. This was almost more like a lack of faith in the gifts that God gave him more than it was anything else. Roughly a talent, they said, was about 15 to 20 years of wages. So it's a lot of money. So a denarius was a single day's wage. This is about 15 to 20 years of wages all wrapped up into one coin. So again, all of them were large sums of money. But what God is trying to do is that he is proud of us when we take those gifts that are given to us. And whether we believe in ourselves, we believe in God 
And we use those talents to bring more people in, to increase the people who are brought back, the saved sheep. Someone gave the analogy that it's almost like a muscle, that if you are given strong muscles and then you don't use them, they go away. Or someone said, ignore your teeth and they'll go away. When we don't use the talents and the abilities and the things that God gives us, they go away. Use your talents and they go stronger. They get better and you find more uses for them. Hey, is this a Start With Small Steps podcast? No, but a message is right out of that podcast. And then it makes you wonder too, you see people who are really doing amazing things on this planet. And the more they do, the more they have, the more they do, the more they have. It makes you wonder too, is it just that one skill to produce, to know the opportunities, to see where to go and decide you're going to do more of what you have? Then Jesus talks about the final judgment. That's what the chapter is called. And he said that the Son of Man, that's him, And all the angels are going to sit on the glorious throne. And in front of him will be all the nations. And he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. This is the same type of parable as the wheat from the weeds, the wheat from the chaff. We've heard a number of parables where he and the angels are going to split everything up at the end of times. They're not doing it ahead of time. They're not kicking people out of the church. They're not doing anything to anyone until the very end of time. And Jesus is saying that's when that time is going to happen. We're not killing anybody. We're not separating anybody. Jesus is going to be the person with his angels who are going to take the sheep from the goats, put the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. And those on the right, he says, come, who are blessed by my father and inherit my kingdom. Here is everything I prepared for you from the beginning of time, the foundation of the world. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me. And when I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, and now's your reward. This is the time where people are gonna get their reward. And, And they were kind of confused. They said, when did we do all this feeding and clothing and visiting? We don't remember that. And he says that when you've done this for the least of my brothers, You did it for me. Again, half of Jesus' message in all of this is how do we think of God? How do we confess our sins? And most of it has to do with how do we treat each other? How do we forgive, give mercy, give compassion, care for our brothers and sisters? And in return, we get that likewise treatment. And again, we don't do it because we're trying to get compassion. We're getting mercy. We're trying to get forgiveness. We do this because Jesus asked us to care for our brothers and sisters. My pastor had a sign on his door of his office that said, God so loved the world, he didn't send a committee. And that's true. He sent each of us, every single one of us as individuals to do the work of the kingdom. Interesting thing to point out is most of these things that Jesus says to do feed people, give them water, visit people in prison. There's all sorts of ministries out there and everyone could do it. He didn't say, write an orchestra composition for me. He didn't ask all of us to write a book or do something. He asked very minimal things and we can all do those things. We're all talented enough to do any of those things. I think that's where it comes in with the each according to his talent. We're each supposed to do the thing we're great at that we have talent for, that we're good at. And there's a variety of things out there. We don't have to look at something and say, well, I'm not a preacher like so-and-so is, so I guess I can't do anything. And it goes back to the great commandment that we're supposed to love God and we're supposed to love other people as ourselves. That's it. It's right there. If you were in a situation where you were poor, you would want to do those things too. Then the final point is we just can't be foolish about it and just say, oh, we'll always have time to do these things. The important thing is that he's not telling us to, we're going to do good things in heaven. We will, but he's telling us to do them right here on earth with our brothers and our sisters on this planet. I always heard the phrase, and I don't know how well I do it, but that Jesus was born yesterday, died today, and is coming back tomorrow. That you should never concern yourself with when Jesus is coming back, other that you should live every day as if he were coming back. My meditation for this week has to do with, I don't know, the the charity of it all. 
it's easy for us to give to charity and to give money, particularly in the United States, I think, to charities to do things to feed people and make sure they're cared for. It's another thing if we're doing it ourselves. I don't think that we're just called to this planet to force our government to do those things, to give money to the charities to do those things. I think God wants us to do those things. And I don't do that. I think the way God calls us to do it, I'm going to have to meditate on that. And so my prayer goes in line with that. Help me to be that good and faithful servant, that I'm doing the right things. You know, part of this podcast and Small Steps with God is not an obligation. I don't want to make it sound like that, but I feel like I've been given so much by being brought as a convert to God. I want to give back. And so because I'm a talker, this is hopefully my talent. I'm guessing talking is my best talent that I have, that I'm using this talent to do those things, to talk to people and hoping that it has an impact, that it helps you to study the Bible. It makes you want to study more of the Bible. That, again, it's an experiment. Can a lay person read the Bible? I'm hoping I'm using my talents, but I also notice the things that he mentions are very simple things and things that we could all do. And so what I want to share is that God does call us to do these things, that he calls us to be that person, because when we're doing all the things that he said, giving water to the thirsty and food to the hungry and putting clothes on people who need clothes and visiting those in hard places like prison, at that time prison was very hard, you're doing it for God. And he says to do it for the least of his brothers. That's my thing that I want to share with other people, that he does call us to do those things. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please tell a friend. I would love to build this community up into something bigger with vibrant communications and discussions. And if you could tell a friend, tell your Bible study, tell people in your church about this podcast, if you're getting some use out of it, we are going to move on very shortly in about a week and a half to Mark. So there's going to be a gospel cycle. We're going to go through the gospels. Again, I'm doing the New Testament in order, and then we'll go on to the acts of the church. So if there's anything I can do to help you study the Bible, or if I got something right and it made you think, or I got something wrong and you're wanting to point it out to me, please feel free to email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. Thank you so much.